Hello everyone, my name is Brett Denman and welcome to another episode of Our High Calling. I hope your last week has been a blessed one. I know my family's been blessed. You know, we like to go out on hikes as a family uh, once a week and um, typically on Saturday afternoon and we had a glorious 70 plus sunny weather this last Saturday so it was a real blessing. You know, one of the things that uh, we like to do when we're out there is just to take in God's nature. You know, when you get out of the city and into the country, you know, you're just, you disconnect from the world and you just plug in to nature. And it's such a blessing, you know, the fresh air and the sounds and the smells of nature. Sometimes the world pokes its head with some garbage uh, that people don't take, take out. But for the most part, it's just a blessing. And I just pray that you take time uh, if you can't do it once a week, you know, try to get out there as often as you can. Get away from the city. Go out into nature and just breathe in the air and take in the sights and sounds uh, of, you know, God's creation. You know, when I was in Korea, and for, you know, those of you who don't know, I, I was an English teacher uh, for 11 years there. And um, there was obviously a language barrier, you know, before I went there. I, I knew little to nothing about the country and um, which I, you know, I, I document this in my testimony book called Soul About Noon, which is available on Amazon. Uh, it's one of the lowest selling and I joke about that, but uh, it's not about selling a lot of books. It's just about me uh, giving the glory to God as I share my conversion from a secular person to a spiritual one. But I, in my book, I talk about overcoming the language, overcoming the difficulties that one has when, you know, you, two people speak a different language. And one of the things that I noticed about the Bible is that it speaks a different language. It may be written in English, but there are aspects about it that are hard to understand if you don't study and you don't learn. You know, there are, are symbols. In the book of Revelation, that have different meanings from what the word is. And we need to figure it out. We need to not come up with our own ideas, because in fact, the Bible tells us not to do that. If you go to 2 Peter 1, verse 20, it says, Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. So we are not to come up with our own ideas what things mean. The Bible is going to uh, explain itself. And that's why you need the whole Bible, not just the New Testament. You, you need, because if you're going to understand the book of Revelation, which many people say it's impossible, it, it's not impossible. Obviously, God wouldn't give it to us if it wasn't possible. But we need to uh, let the Bible interpret itself. And a lot of people make mistakes when they don't do that. And I'm going to give you an example. In the book of Acts, there's a story about a, a Peter, and he had a dream. And I'm going to read, this is from uh, Acts chapter 10. And I'm going to start in verse 9. It says, On the morrow, as they went on their journey and drew nigh unto the city, Peter went up upon the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. And he became very hungry and would have eaten, but while they made ready, he fell into a trance and saw heaven opened and a certain vessel descended unto him as it had been a great sheet knit at the four corners and let down to the earth, wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth and wild beasts and creeping things and fowls of the air. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. In verse 14, But Peter said, No, not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice spoke unto him again the second time, What God had hath cleansed, that, that call not thou common. So this is where most Christians stop, right there. Okay, so this dream is showing him that uh, all food is good to eat. And that's, that's what they take from this. And in fact, that's, 
it had this dream has absolutely nothing to do with food. And that this is taken out of context. This is where people put their own interpretation into it. So the deal was that the Jews were having a hard time going to the Gentiles' home to give them the message. Because obviously in the culture, the Gentiles were unclean and you know they had to do a bunch of ritual washing if they ever came in contact with them and so forth. But in this particular um, situation, Peter gives an interpretation of his own dream. So do you stop there and come up with your own interpretation, or do you allow Peter to interpret it himself? So if you allow Peter to give you an interpretation of his own dream from God, then you have to keep reading. And let's go a little bit further so we stopped at verse 15. But if you keep going, let's go to 28. And in verse 28 it says, And he said unto them, Ye know how that it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come unto one of another nation. But God has showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. So the dream wasn't about food, it was about men. And what was God showing Peter that don't call any man unclean and that you are to go into these homes of these Gentiles and give them the good news. So here you have the situation that I came across where these people are putting their own interpretation on something in the Bible. But the Bible is going to give you its own interpretation. So let's go to the book of Revelation. So this is Revelation is where many people stumble because they they can't understand they can't understand the reading but why would jesus give us a book uh that that we can't understand he he wouldn't do that and in fact if you go to revelation chapter 1 and verse 3 it says blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand. So it's a blessing. Why is God going to give us something in, that we can't understand but call it a blessing? He wouldn't. So let's take a look at some things in, uh, in the book of Revelation. So we're going to be reading things. And maybe what we're reading isn't exactly what we're reading. Does that make sense? Well, it should make sense because there's a lot of... Um, symbols symbolism and you know things that one word has more than one meaning but you have to understand because the bible is going to tell you what it means so let's let's get into it let's get into it let's find uh in the book of revelation and let's break this down let's go let's start uh how about Let's go to Revelation 14. Okay, so Revelation 14, let's do uh, 14 verse 6. And it says, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven. Okay, so here we have an angel, right? So what is what is in the context of an angel? What is an angel? Well, let's go back to the book of Daniel. And angel isn't just, you know, some flying created being in heaven. Let's go to Daniel chapter 8 and let's read what it says in verse 16. And it says, And I heard a man's voice between the banks of Uli, which called and said, Gabriel, make this man to understand the vision. Okay, so Gabriel was an angel, right? The archangel. And it's to help, the angel was to help understand the vision, okay? And let's continue. And it says here um, that in verse 29, 21, Yea, while I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched about the time of the evening oblation. And he informed me, and talked with me and said, O Daniel, I am now come forth to give thee skill 
and understanding. So what is, what is an angel? Well, an angel is a messenger. So here we have in Revelation 14, verse 6, that this angel, and in fact there's three angels in Revelation 14, 6, that have a message, because an angel is a messenger. So when you, when you read it with the interpretation, it says, And I saw another messenger fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. So here it's talking about this messenger has something for everybody on earth. And, you know, what was that message? That particular message was, you know, to fear God and give glory to him. And if you keep going, in verse 8 it says, Another angel saying Babylon is fallen. Well, what is Babylon? And so let's go in the, in, into the Bible and let's see where you have interpretation for what is Babylon. Let's go to the book of Genesis. So if we go to Genesis and let's start uh, in 25. So let's go to Genesis. Uh, actually, let's go further back than that. Let's go to uh, verse 10, uh, chapter 10. So Genesis And uh, 10, and we're going to read 8 to 10. So it says here, And Cush begat Nimrod, he began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord, therefore it is said, even the Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel. And then it goes on, uh, uh, to say that in in the notes that he Nimrod right one of these this mighty man the one um, this is right after the flood that he started uh, this city called Babylon Babel and we know that the Tower of Babel means confusion of language right it's confusion uh, so anyway um, Nimrod he he built this city now was it god's plan for men on the earth to live in cities absolutely not right he put adam and eve in a garden he wanted them to live in the country he wanted them to live outdoors in nature and tend to the animals and tend to the ground and be farmers he didn't want god doesn't want city people even though uh the new jerusalem right the city of god but that's different than what uh, God wants us to have here on earth because what happens is the cities of earth become uh, hotbeds of sin, of vice, of violence, of debauchery. You know, no place that anybody who, who wants to live godly should be. And in fact, I believe here at the end time, we should move our families out of the cities. We should move to, to the country where we can, um, I think, better endure the end days that we are upon. So let's, um, so here's the first mention of Babylon. Uh, let's keep going. Let's go to chapter 11 and read starting in, in verse 6. And it says, And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all language. And this is, and this they began, begin to do. And now nothing be restrained from them which they have imagined to do, right? So the people of, of the time, you know, they're building this. Uh, tower and and the thoughts of right of the minds of their imagination is going crazy again just like before the flood and you know it says therefore uh, in verse 9 therefore is the name of it called babel because the lord did there confound the language of all the earth and from thence did the lord scatter them abroad the face of the earth so when we have babylon babylon means confusion and because we're dealing with the book of Revelation, we're talking about spiritual matters, right? Because in the end time, uh, the great controversy is between good and evil. And if there's a warning from God's angels about Babylon, the great city, right? And it's, it's talking about confusion. 
But if we keep reading, it says, and I'm back in the book of Revelation, Babylon has fallen, the great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine. All right, that's interesting. So what, so what is wine then? What does wine represent? Right? So let's go to the book of Jeremiah. And let's see what Jeremiah has to say about what is wine. So if we go to Jeremiah, and I'm going to read uh, 25. So Jeremiah 25, and we're going to read 31. I'm sorry, we're going to read uh, 25, 15 to 18. It says, For thus saith the Lord God of Israel unto me, Take the wine cup of this fury at my hand, and cause all nations to whom I send thee to drink it. And they shall drink and be moved and be mad because of the sword that I will send among them. Then uh, took I the cup of the Lord's hand and made all nations to drink unto whom the Lord had sent me, to wit Jerusalem and the cities of Judah and the kings thereof and the princes thereof to make them a desolation and astonishment and hissing and a curse as it is this day. So here we have that he he's having them drink. And obviously it's it has to do with information, right? Uh, knowledge. Let's see. Uh, he talks about it again in chapter 51. So let's go to Jeremiah 51 and verse 7. And it says, Babylon hath been a golden cup in the Lord's hand, and made all the earth drunken. The nations have drunken of her wine, therefore the nations are mad. So this, uh, this wine is, is about teachings. It's about doctrine. But if it's from Babylon, then it must be false teaching, false doctrine. And here in Revelation 14, verse 6, it says that Babylon is falling be, is fallen because they were uh, drinking, the nations were drinking the wine uh, of her fornication. Now, uh, they are drinking in this false doctrine, and they're getting drunk on it, right? That means they're consuming a lot of it. Now, do we have a, a a lot of churches in our world today that have false doctrine or not biblical doctrine? Well, sure we do. I mean, what is there, like 30,000 different denominations and they all have their own belief system? I mean, all of them can't be, uh, can't be true. So, yes, here God is saying at the end that... Uh, they drink the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Now, what is fornication? Well, now not, let's not go to the definition of the world. Let's let's get back into the definition that the Bible tells us what it is. So, if we want to understand what fornication is, let's go to the book of Ezekiel. And it's it's you know I find it that this Jeremiah and Isaiah. And Ezekiel, they have all the definitions of these words that we're looking in Revelation. So don't uh, don't get rid of uh, the Old Testament. We need it. We need both witnesses. The right, the two witnesses is found in the Book of Revelation: the Old Testament and the New Testament. But let's go into um, fornication. What does it mean for fornication? So if we go to Ezekiel chapter sixteen. And we're going to read 16, verse 15. And it says here in 15, But thou didst trust in thine own beauty, and playst the harlot because of thy renown, and pourest out thy fornication on every one that passed by. Uh, his it was. So here we have um, a situation where um, they... They, uh, this knowledge, right, is talking about God's people, right? God's people w was being unfaithful. And, you know, remember, when we're talking about God, we're talking about spiritual things. So if you're being unfaithful to God, how do you, how do you be unfaithful to God? Well, obviously, it's you're believing wrong things. 
And, you know, if you are a harlot, right, if you're a prostitute, then, you know, then that means that you are, you know, a church. And uh, if you are committing fornication, that means that church is is being unfaithful to to God. And let's let's read also in verse 26 where it says, Thou hast also committed fornication with the Egyptians, thy neighbors, great of flesh, and hast increased thy whoredoms to provoke me to anger. So when you do things that aren't biblical, when you take part in worldly things, then you are committing fornication uh, with the world. Or if you go to a different church or you go to a different religion or anything that that you're not faithful to God and his teachings. You know, that that right there um, brings God to anger. You know, he's angry because, you know, if you are a confessed Christian, yet you're doing these, going to these other doctrines, you're, you're committing fornication. So here, as we read it in Revelation 14, 6, we have Babylon, right, which is false doctrine. And the wine is, you know, is the doctrine and people are uh, drinking it and they're committing fornication. So they, instead of the, the pure truth that comes from the word of God, they are drinking this other doctrine and now they are um, basically being unfaithful to God, right? Fornication with this other truth. And that's the warning that, that these angels in Revelation 14 are, are trying to get at. Uh, because the third angel followed them saying, If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in the forehead or in the hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture. So God wants us to drink the wine of truth. Right, he wants us. Uh, if wine is doctrine, you, you can have pure doctrine, and there is pure doctrine in in the Word. But you have to search it and you have to find it because you know what? If you're drinking pure doctrine, imagine pure juice. Now, what is unpure juice? Well, that's probably going to be the alcohol, right? The fermented. That's going to make you drunk. Pure grape juice doesn't make you drunk. In fact, it's a blessing to your body. So if you're drinking the pure wine, the pure doctrine, you're not going to get drunk. Just like pure grape juice isn't going to isn't going to make you drunk. It's going to benefit your body. It's going to benefit uh, your life, and that's what God wants. But if you drink the fermented grape juice, then that's wine, that's alcohol, right? And that's going to destroy your body. And God doesn't want that, but that's what it's doing. That's the result of it. And so here God is talking about, let's talk about this beast, right? What, what is um, a beast? Well, you know, we understand the dragon to be Satan. And if we go uh, to the book of Daniel, Daniel is going to explain to us what is a beast? So if we go to Daniel 7, and let's read verse 23. It says, Thus he said, The fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon the earth, which shall be diverse from all kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, and shall tread it down and break it to pieces. So what, what we're understanding here is a beast represents a kingdom or a nation. It, it's a government. It's a political power. So. If any man uh, worships the beast in his image, right? You, we can't worship political entities. We cannot worship governments. And ultimately, we know that this beast is receiving its power by the dragon. Because if it's false, obviously Satan is the one supplying it with the power. And so here we have this beast and his image right so even if if one political party 
is, is now reflecting their ways on the whole nation or other nations, then that's the image of it. And it says, and receive his mark in the forehead or in the hand. So what does that mean? Well, a hand, your hand in the Bible represents, it's a symbol of, of work. And where, where do we get that? Well, let's go to the book of Ecclesiastes. So if we go to Ecclesiastes, let me find it. Ecclesiastes. Because remember, here, the, the Bible is going to explain it, everything to us. It's so wonderful. So if we go to Ecclesiastes chapter 9 and verse 10. So Ecclesiastes, uh, Ecclesiastes 9 verse 10. And it says, Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might, for there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave, whether thou goest. So, whatever your hand findest to do, do it. So, it's talking about work. So, your hand is your work. Uh, so, here uh, in the context of uh, Revelation 14, uh, verse 9, it says, if, if you worship the beast in the image and receive his mark in the forehead or in the hand. So, whether whether it's in your mind, right? The forehead just re represents your mind. So whether you um, intellectually accept the mark or if you, you, you do it for work. Like you don't accept it, but obviously you want to make money. And think about, you know, with the jab, you know, if you don't accept, and I'm not saying that the jab is the mark of the beast. I'm not saying that. And in fact, I know that's not what it is. But this is a great example uh, of what it could happen in the future, that if you don't take the jab, you don't work. Now, some people don't agree with the jab, but they, they need to make money, so they take it. So the people who, who say, well, I agree with it, and let's just say, uh, you know, is an example that if it's the mark, then, they're, then it's in the forehead because they agree with the jab. But if they, they just want to make money, they don't want to lose their job, and, and they take it anyway, well, that's in the hand. So either way, they're still going to get you, whether you agree with it. So it's, it's coercion comes into play at some point with the mark of the beast. They're, it's going to be the exact same way, right? The carrot and the stick. They're either going to get you the nice way or they're going to get you, uh, you know, by making you and your family suffer. But that's the beauty of a Christian who loves Jesus is that there is nothing this world can do to, to force us to lose salvation. Because we understand that this, this world is not our home. This, this, this life that I have now, it's, it's, it's for God. And you, you need to live that way. That you're ready to give up. That, and remember, the promise is that you'll get a glorified body. So what? What can they really do if they destroy your body? God, when, when Jesus comes again and the resurrection happens, they're just going to give you a glorified body. But what I'm saying here is the, the book of Revelation, it can be understood. The, the symbols, the words, the literal meaning, they can be found in other areas of the Bible. And a lot of times they explain themselves, like the book of Daniel. Uh, you know, you have the, the metal man, but Daniel explains exactly what each metal is. You know, all the strange beasts of Daniel, it explains exactly what they are. And the same with the, the book of Revelation. Once you understand what these words mean, then you can piece it together. So when it's talking about angels, you understand it's a messenger. When it's talking about blood, you understand that it's life. You know, when it's talking about a cup, it's talking about judgment. And, you know, as you go through and study out all these words, the book of Revelation makes complete sense. And, the, and, and then it becomes a blessing to you because there's so many warnings and promises in there. So let's just continue to study the word of God. Let's continue to pray and ask God to bring you understanding because that's what he wants to do, right? 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is God-breathed 
and is useful instruction for conviction, for correction, and for the training in righteousness. He wants us to understand. He wants us to study. And let's continue to do that. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love and mercy, and we thank you for bringing the understanding that we need to uh, understand the Bible. And thank you for the Holy Spirit that gives us the wisdom and knowledge, Lord. And we thank you for the blessing of uh, these warnings and these promises that help us uh, day by day. Lord, be with our friends and family. Bless and keep us as we begin a new week. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, thank you, everyone. I pray you all have a wonderful week, and I'll see you right back here next week. God bless. Thank you.